What's it like to live with dementia? Most of us fear it more than death. In fact, Dr. Sandeep Jahar's family would not even utter the word Alzheimer's until they had no choice. The physician wanted to understand what was happening to his cherished father and the best way to cope. Those challenging years are now chronicled in Dr. Jahar's memoir, My Father's Brain, Life in the Shadows of Alzheimer's. For nearly seven years, I pushed and prodded, threatened and cajoled, begged and pleaded, encouraged and ridiculed. I made my father walk, bought him books, forced him to do puzzles. I loved him, cared for him, and hated him too. Hello, it's Victoria from HEC Books, where we talk with authors about their latest titles. If you're new to our channel, make sure you subscribe for more great content like this. Now let's meet physician and author Sandeep Jahar, who talks about his insightful memoir and his father's descent into dementia. Dr. Jahar, welcome back to St. Louis. Thank you. So when did you graduate from WashU Medical School? So uh, 1998, I uh, short-tracked because I had gotten a graduate degree at Berkeley and WashU had this great program where you could uh, finish medical school in three years instead of four because the fourth year is typically a research year and I had done a lot of research so they gave me this option of short-tracking and then I went to New York. Terrific. Well, yeah. good to have you back. And Thank you. we'll talk about some of your connections in this journey, uh, My Father's Brain and Life in the Shadows of Alzheimer's. This is your fourth book, yes. but none have been as personal as this one. So as a doctor, as a cardiologist, was it difficult, enlightening, or both to write a memoir, but also about your father's descent into dementia, but while combining it with your professional expertise? Was there this tug of war? When I was going through this experience with my father, um, I really didn't have a blueprint for what to do. You know, I, uh, even though I'm a doctor, uh, I, I'm a cardiologist, but um, you know, I was surprisingly naive about neurological disease. And it actually turns out that my mother developed Parkinson's disease. I write about that in the book as well. But the books, the focus is on the Alzheimer's because that's sort of the the emperor of all, you know, brain diseases. I wanted to write the book that I needed when I was going through that journey. You know, both a sort of personal story of what I went through, what my family went through, but also enough about the history and science of the disease that I could provide some clarity to caregivers, you know, because it, it's a very frustrating experience yes. caring for someone with, with, with Alzheimer's, and it's doubly frustrating when you don't know what to expect. You don't know what's going on in the brain. Why is this person I love um, acting this way? And, and so one of the goals of the book is to bring in some medical expertise and explain exactly what's going on in the brain. What, what are the sort of deficits that appear first? Why do they appear? Um, the person you're caring for is not being willful. They can't help it. But it's very hard to understand that when you're caring for them day in and day out. Boy, it is no holes barred. They're all, truly, uh, with your family dynamic, uh, with the way you felt, the frustrations you felt with your father, and sometimes mother, but mainly your father, for sure, the dynamic that might have already been in the family, but just got exacerbated by this illness. So that other families could probably relate on some level. Um, you've also come from a medical family uh, in terms of your siblings. That created some difficulties as for care, a difference of opinions. Yes. But let's go back to your parents, both ill, like you mentioned, mom with Parkinson's at the same time. And she's the one that said, I think he needs to see a neurologist. Something's not right with your father. That's right. She, she pointed it out. She had the first sort of uh, insight into it, you know, because my brother and I had been living in New York. My parents were in Fargo, North Dakota. Yeah. My father was a professor. Uh, was running a wheat genetics lab. Was very successful. Was publishing papers in the top journals, and then sort of around um, maybe 2012, I had a conversation with him, and he said, you know. The, the people at work want me to publish two papers a year. And I said, Dad, that's not going to be a big problem for you. You know, you've published hundreds of papers in, you know, Nature and uh, Cell and, you know, all the top journals in the, in the world. He said, 
I don't know if I can do it. And he's in his early 70s at this yeah, point? Yeah, he was in his um, early 70s yeah, at the yeah. time. And so he started spending a lot of time in the office, um, but not really getting much done. And, um, you know, the dynamic we had is one that I think a lot of Americans share. You know, uh, it used to be that kids stayed at home. You know, they grew up, they sort of, you know, worked on the family farm. Uh, there were a lot of sort of multi-generational families about a century ago. But things have changed. And, you know, I'd say for the better, you know, kids kind of grow up and go off and blaze their own paths. That's exactly what my brother and I did. But the problem is that when you're separated geographically, you don't really know what's going on with your parents. And we didn't know. And my mother and my father were pretty secretive about it. So finally, when we convinced my dad to move to, to New York, ostensibly because my mother was getting sicker, but at that, by the time they showed up, I knew there was something going on with my dad as well. And um, I went on a walk with my mother and, and she said, um, she was telling me about how um, my father had driven to Sears and um, he lost his way home. This was in the new community in Long Island that they were living. And I said, well, that's not such a big deal. They just moved here. She said, yeah, but he stopped the car on the road and he stepped out onto Inco oncoming traffic to try to stop drivers to ask his way home mm -hmm. instead of calling mm -hmm. one of his sons. Mm -hmm. And then she stopped, she said, do you think he has Alzheimer's? And that was the first time that anyone in the family had mentioned that word. As you went through this journey with your father, there were cultural issues for sure. Yes. Was it helpful or painful to share the realities and maybe some vulnerabilities? Y yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, the cultural piece was really important in my family. My parents, you know, grew up in India. And in India, there's really no social safety net to speak of. It's really um, sons, right? I mean, that's just, it's, the, it's a patriarchal, right. you know, sort of society. And the greatest protection you can have as an uh, aging person in India is to have a son because sons are expected to take care of aging parents. So my parents had two sons, and they had a daughter. I think if my mother had had her true wish, she would have wanted to move to Minneapolis, where my sister was. But her culture wouldn't allow her to you know, rely on a daughter and a son-in-law in, you know, her old age. The, the, the thought is that daughters go off to a different family. And so it really was, it was up to me and my brother to sort of, and we were both doctors, to sort of manage the situation with my parents, with them aging, and with us working full time as physicians with our own families. And frankly, we weren't that well equipped, you know. Surprisingly. To do it. Two intelligent men, and you did differ on, on the care for them in the end, and for your father for sure. I would say we differed at many steps yes. along the way. Yes. because. I was always very close to my father. My brother had a, a little more fractious relationship yes, with him. Yes. And so when my father was really deteriorating, my brother, I think, you know, understandably advocated for um, having him go to um, an institutional setting because he was becoming just very difficult to manage. Uh, we had hired a caregiver. He kept kicking her out. One of the problems with Alzheimer's is you lose awareness that you have a disease. And so he did as well. He didn't know why he needed help. And so he kept kicking out the caregiver and we were, it was just this back and forth, back and forth. Um, so I'd say we differed on that and then clearly toward the end of his life. Thanks for watching. And if you like this video, give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more like it. In part two of our conversation with Dr. Jahar and his memoir, My Father's Brain, we find out more about the tug of war among his siblings on the best form of care for their father.